Once I had the few remaining objects of my father's life in front of me, I knew that I would eventually open up the box and plunge into what had been the quiet madness of his last years. Knowing that, I held off for as long as possible. I made myself a cup of tea, after which I checked the hallway to see if my neighbor had picked up a newspaper for the day. He hadn't, and so I brought it inside and read quickly through the headlines while sipping my tea. I had never done it before and had no reason for doing so now, but I checked as well the daily index of stocks, bonds, and commodities on the back pages of the business section. I said out loud to no one, since I was alone, look at that, gold has gone up again. I tried again a few seconds later with the stock listed as WSK, which I'd posted yesterday, a rather significant, and I'm sure to many people, disappointing loss. For a few more seconds, I became one of them. Come on, WSK, I said. You're killing me here. And while I still couldn't see myself as one of those severely tailored men in suits who marched around Manhattan, I did begin to think that perhaps the difference between us weren't so great after all. We all had fathers. And some of us even had dead fathers. And speaking of dead fathers, here was what was left of mine, sitting just a few feet away in a cardboard box, the only true and proper resting place for a man like that. That was the only way I could think of approaching my father's belongings, through indirect oblique angles, as if I had just stumbled upon them at a party, long lost friends I hadn't thought of in years and whose names I was struggling to remember. I had to walk around them, ignore them, and pretend as if they were all just part of another normal working day for someone like myself, a stockbroker or an analyst in training. I didn't expect to find any letters or a journal that my father had kept. He was hardly the type for sentimental preservation and was never one to state his thoughts directly. What I did find, however, could be considered a record of events or a loose journal of thoughts. My father, as it turned out, was a drawer not a particularly talented one, but a drawer nonetheless. Of the hundreds of pieces of loose paper floating around the bottom of the box, almost all contained sketches of boats of various shapes and sizes that he had made. There were sailboats, tugboats, and freight ships, speedboats, and a few ocean liners that appeared to be sketched from a catalog. There were boats hovering alone in the middle of a blank white page, and others that were drawn out at sea, complete with waves and a stretch of land in the corner. A few were barely larger than the corners of the pages they occupied, while some nearly stretched across all four corners and were intricately designed with portholes, anchors, and flags blowing in the wind. There were dozens of sketches of three-dimensional boxes floating around them, as if my father were trying to find a way of fitting those boxes inside the boats themselves. This is what he saw and thought of every day. Boats coming and going, unloading their goods or bringing new ones on board. Some of the more detailed ones must have been drawn up close, perhaps only a few feet away, or maybe from the boats themselves. It was an easy walk, entirely downhill, from the YMCA to the piers. He must have made it often while he was still alive. The pictures nearest the top were barely sketches, spare, with only the general outline of a ship near the bottom left-hand corner. They have the air of having been drawn from a distance, both physical and emotional, that speaks to the way my father must have lived those last few years. There are a number of ways of looking at those drawings. The first and easiest would be to say that they were pictures of things that he saw every day. And perhaps the last and most sentimental would be to say they express some deep eternal longing to be carried away, some profound private knowledge of death, which was just around the corner, an echo of the river Styx and the final passage we all make out of life. I knew at the time that I would make of them what I wanted depending on the mood and on occasion. And on that particular day, there were signs that my father had never ceased to try to capture the moment everything in his life seemed to go wrong. Besides the pictures, that box contained one last interesting memento. A small bundle of photographs of him in front of various monuments taken all over the world. There he is in Rome, outside the Colosseum, and in Athens, next to the Parthenon and in Paris with the Eiffel Tower looming large in the background. In each picture, he's wearing almost the exact same outfit, dark brown slacks with a beige button-down shirt with a brown vest over it. He looks something like a cowboy, one misplaced and lost in time. The 
pictures must cover at least a year, maybe even two. In one, he's holding a small suitcase as he stands next to a cot, which explains why in part his outfits over the years hardly varied. It was the one decent set of clothes he had. And if a picture of him was going to be taken, then it had to be taken in the best possible light, with the finest clothes he owned. What surprised me most about the content was how little they revealed. If my father was a stranger before, he seemed even more so now that I'd caught a glimpse of his final thoughts. It wasn't supposed to have to work. It wasn't supposed to have to have worked out like this. According to the stories, children who opened boxes containing the last precious items of their parents were always granted some vital, significant revelation. What's a prayer? If I speak for the dead, I must leave this animal of my body. I must write the same poem over and over for an empty page, the white flag of the surrender. If I speak for them, I must walk on the edge of myself. I must leave the blind man who ran through the rooms without touching the furniture. Yes, I leave. I can cross the streets just in what is it. I can dance in my sleep and laugh in front of the mirror. Even sleep with a prayer, Lord. I will praise your madness and in a language not mine. Speak of music that wakes us, music in which we move. For whatever I say is a kind of petition. And the darkest day must I praise. Unto us. In a soldier's uniform and wooden shoes she danced. A tired the rent of the my antlers. Her husband arrested a pregnant woman from a burning house. We heard laughter. Each day so one little artillery in that fire who burns its genitals. My aunt was to other people, children. She clicked her tongue as they cried. And August bullet curtains evening after evening. I saw her child between her fingers. She wrote lessons on an empty blackboard. Her hand moved and the board remained empty. We lived in a city by the sea, but there was another city at the bottom of the sea. And only local children believed in its existence. She believed them. She had her husband's picture on a wall in her apartment, each month on a different wall. I now see her with that picture hammer in her left hand, nail in her mouth, from her mouth a smell of vile garlic. She moves toward me in her pajamas, arguing with me and with herself. The evenings are my evidence. This evening, in which she dips her hands up to her elbows, the evening is asleep inside her shoulder, her shoulder, rounded by sleep. Uh, my mother's tongue. I now see her windows. Open in the rain, lantern in the wind, she rides a wild pony for my birthday, a white pony on a seventh floor. And where will we keep it? On a balcony, the pony making, on a balcony for nine weeks, yes, at the center of my life, my mother dances, yes, here. As in childhood, my mother has to describe the stages of my happiness. She speaks of soups, she eats of their telling. Between the regiments of saucers and towels, she moves so fast. She is motionless, opening and closing doors. But what was happiness? A pony and a balcony, my mother's past. A cloak she wore on her shoulder. I draw an axe through the afternoon to see her sixty. Caught in a foreign language, young, not young, my mother gallops a pony on the seventh floor. She becomes a stranger and acts herself, opens for a 
Schatz, Schatz, for the soap. American Toast. In a city made of zivit, we dance it on a rooftop, my hands and her breasts. Subtracting day from day, I add this woman, some calls to my days of atonement. Her lover lived the form of bonus of her face. We were making love all evening at all her stories, the rituals of rain, happiness is money, yes, but only the smallest. She asked me to pray to bow to the Jerusalem, we bow it to the left, I saw two bakers, a shoe store, the smell of hay, smell of horses and hay, when Moses broke the sacred tablet, some say nice rich pieces, the pieces carved with adultery and kill and love the poor, not only, no, no, no. An helper, this woman, who's forgetting, is a plot against forgetting, naked and her galoche, she was it, and even her cat was it, she said. All that is musical enough is a memory, but I did not know English. I danced it sitting down, she straightened it and bent and straightened. A trample of music, a trample in her hand. And the last poem from me. Having sifted through everything I now know about the tiger's wife, I can tell you that this much is fact. In 1941, in late spring, without declaration or warning, German bombs started falling on the city and did not stop for three days. The tiger did not know that they were bombs. He did not know anything beyond the hiss and screech of the fighters passing overhead, missiles falling, the sound of bears bellowing in another part of the fortress, the sudden silence of birds. There was smoke and terrible warmth, a gray sun rising and falling in what seemed like a matter of minutes, and the tiger, frenzied, dry-tongued, ran back and forth across the span of rusted bars lowing like an ox. He was alone and hungry, and that hunger, coupled with the thunderous noise of bombardment, had burned in him a kind of awareness of his own death, an imminent and innate knowledge he could neither dismiss nor succumb to. He did not know what to do with it. His water had dried up, and he rolled and rolled in the stone bed of his trough, in the uneaten bones lying in a corner of the cage, making that long, sad sound the tigers make. After two days of pacing, his legs gave out, and he was reduced to a contraction of limbs lying in his own waist. He had lost the ability to move, to produce sound, to react in any way. When a stray bomb hit the south wall of the citadel, sending up a choking cloud of smoke and ash and shattering bits of rubble into the skin of his head and flank, his heart should have stopped. The iridescent air and the feeling of his fur folding back like paper in the heat and then the long hours during which he crouched at the back of his pen, watching the ruptured flank of the citadel wall. All these things should have killed him, but something, some flickering of the blood, forced him to his feet and through the gap in the wall. He was not the only one. Years later, they would write about wolves running down the street, a polar bear standing in the river. They would write about how flights of parrots were seen for weeks above the city, how a prominent engineer and his family lived an entire month off a zebra carcass. The tiger's route through the city that night took him north to the waterfront behind the citadel, where the remains of the merchant's port and Jewish quarter spread in flattened piles of brick down the bank and into the waters of the Danube. The river was lit by fires, and those who had gone into it were washing back against the bank where the tiger stood. He considered the possibility of swimming across, and under optimal circumstances, he might have attempted it, but the smell rising off the bodies turned the tiger around, sent him back past the Citadel Hill and into the ruined city. People must have seen him, but in the wake of bombardment, he was anything but a tiger to them, a joke, an insanity, a religious hallucination. He drifted, enormous and silent, down the alleys of old town, past the smashed in doors of coffee houses and bakeries, past motor cars flung through shop windows. He went down the tramway, up and over fallen trolleys in his path, 
beneath lines of electric cable that ran through the city and now hung broken and black as jungle creeper. Some hours before sunrise, the tiger found himself in the abandoned market at Kalinia, two blocks up from where my grandfather and my grandma would buy their first apartment 15 years later. Here, the scent of death that clung to the wind drifting in from the north separated from the pools of rich stench that ran between the cobbles of the market square. He walked with his head down, savoring the spectrum of unrecognizable aromas, splattered tomatoes and spinach that stuck to the grooves in the road, broken eggs, bits of fish, the clotted fat leavings on the sides of the butcher's stands, the thick smell smeared around the cheese counter. His thirst insane, the tiger lapped up pools from the leaky fountain where the flower women filled their buckets and then put his nose into the face of a sleeping child who had been left wrapped in blankets under the pancake stand. Finally, up through the sleepless neighborhoods of the lower city, with the sound of the second river in his ears, the tiger began to climb the trail into the king's forest. I like to think that he went along our old carriage trail. I like to imagine his big cat paw prints in the gravel, his exhausted, square-shouldered walk along my childhood paths years before I was even born. But in reality, the way through the undergrowth was faster, the moss easier on paws he had shredded on city rubble, the cooling feel of the trees bending down to him as he pushed up the hill until at last he reached the top, the burning city far behind him. During Lum's years as a soldier, Mai was the only child who asked outright about his killing others in the war. It was a question she directed at him with the quiet vigilance of a priest coming out the first time as, have you ever killed anyone in the war, Father? Progressing to, how many people have you killed, Father? Culminating in, how did you kill them, Father? And in some form or the other, the brief inquiry usually ended in the same way. Silly child, we're forced to kill in war. And what does a young girl want with knowing how I killed people? You won't tell me? None of you children need to know, not from me or anyone. He expected this response to silence her from further questions, but suspected, too, that her interest would return on his next visit. She was a curious girl, though, that her, uh, though it seemed her curiosity was not born of some need for understanding, but was simply impulsive, as spontaneous as a nervous tick or a ludicrous dream. They might be walking together in a crowded marketplace or sitting alone on the porch, and abruptly she would ask him such questions as though they were part of a game she and Lum were playing, an exchange of secrets that would make up for their time apart. Perhaps it was his absence that inspired her curiosity, but Lum felt it odd that he, in turn, hardly ever thought of her or anyone in his family while he was away. Out in the jungle, consumed by the fear of death and the vacuous passage of time, his mind did not wander to his wife, his children, or his home. He thought of less complicated things, like smoking on a cool, rainy Saigon night, uh, that tingle in his breath, or eating a bowl of pho steaming hot with fresh basil leaves and lime, the raw beef submerged in the broth, curling pink and then gray. And inevitably, his thoughts veered not to his family, but to where he actually was, a mass of crumpled, hot earth overlain by trees and brush and vines and human bone, a verdurous place that would not that could not bury the violence and the terror, but only mute them. It seemed this precarious world had no place or patience for thoughts of home. It was a world entirely separate from the one inhabited by his family, and in some irrational way, he was never able to believe in both at the same time, which was what bemused Lum when the war followed him home. There were times when he returned from being gone six months and found her sitting on the front porch with an expression that saw him unchanged since they last met an expression no different had he been her father 365 days out of the year and just returned then from a brief walk. But after a day or two of him being home, in a moment of sudden curiosity, or perhaps unease, she would ask him one of those questions. In his mind, it was the same recurring moment, she and he walking through the neighborhood, the city, her hand latched to his, passing the palisade of buildings that flanked the streets, passing houses thrown open for anyone to come eat at, or shop at, or perhaps drop by for some tea and conversation, passing through the bustle of traffic and pedestrians and vendors and vagrants, passing the church 
and from there the cemetery where the colorful graves of his family and friends resided. When out of nowhere she would ask the question, and a memory like this one would return to him. Where one day he and his troops came upon a village burning within a clearing of jungle, smoke billowing into the napalm tinged air like ribbons, and they all creeping among the abandoned interior of the village, stepping over bodies, some with charred flesh, some cow thick with dried blood, and still others peacefully dead as though asleep. There was one soldier who, at the sudden sound of voices or cries, lunged at a hut that had just caught fire. This same soldier, only days before, had wept for his mother. Lum remembered his slight build, his neck from behind resembling a woman's, his voice timid as he refused his meals, and those dull eyes as he quietly cried to himself and clenched his fist to his chest. Those same eyes glared at the entrance to the thatched hut, now engulfed in a spiraling welter of flames. His shoulders hunched, his rifle punching the air in front of him. The boy soldier leaned away from the leaping flames and kept his eyes on the doorway of the hut. As if falling from the sky into sound, a feral cry rang out, and then out of the dark column of smoke fuming from the doorway, the fiery body of some animal materialized. The boy floundered a few steps back as the animal contorted its body and flailed its legs, giving a series of ferocious yelps. It was a dog, nearly as tall as the boy's waist, its color now obscured by the serpentine wave of fire jumping along its back and legs. The boy appeared momentarily awestruck by the sight, not so much scared as delighted, but the dog suddenly leaped awkwardly at him and he kicked it in the head, staggering it back into the doorway as it still writhed maniacally and barked at the excuse me, and barked out the squeals of a pig. The boy kicked it again, even harder this time, as if also to put out the flames scorching its flesh, but it only set the dog reeling back into the hut. Instantly the dog reappeared, and again the boy kicked it in the chest, and it reared like a horse and fell back into the smoke. Each time the dog stumbled out of the hut, the boy would kick it back with much more force, covering his mouth to keep from choking on the smoke, bowing his head to avoid the flames. It yelped each time he kicked at its ribs or its head, loudly at first, and gradually each time he kicked at its, and gradually weaker, until eventually it made no sound at all, tiring with each charge from the doorway before finally disappearing one last time into the black innards of the hut with a long, ululating bellow. The boy backed away from the hut as one wall caved in and sent a rush of black smoke and tangled fire towards the sky, stuttering sparks of in ignited thatch into the air. Lem had been watching with equanimity Unsure if the pain lodged in his chest was caused by hunger, the pungent heat, or what he had just seen, he felt an urge to say something to the boy, console him, slap him. But before he could step forward, he saw the boy walk up again to the failing hut. And for reasons perhaps elusive even to himself, the boy began firing his rifle directly into the hut, firing into the smoke and flames of the falling doorway until he was empty, and no one, not even Lum, could look at him. No, Lum would always say to her, his daughter, as his memory faded, I will not tell you how men kill and die in the war. This morning I woke up and was 15 years old. Each year is like putting a new coat over all the old ones. Sometimes I reach into the pockets of my childhood and pull things out. When Michel gets home from his shop, he said we're going out to celebrate, maybe to a movie or the McDonald's, on Boulevard Voltaire. Michel is not my real father. He grew up in Paris and did a spell in prison. I think he was used to being alone, but we've lived together so long now, I'm not sure he could survive without me. We live in Paris, and I think I was born here, but I may never know for sure. Everyone thinks I'm Chinese, and I look Chinese, but Michel says I'm more French than bread. It's the afternoon of my birthday, but still the morning of my life. I'm walking on the Pont des Arts. It's a small wooden bridge, and Americans sit in colorful knots drinking wine. Even though I'm only 15 and haven't had a girlfriend yet, I can tell who is in love with who when I look at people. A woman in a wheelchair is being pushed across the bridge by her husband. They're in love. Only the back wheels move across each plank. He tilts the chair toward him as though his body is drinking from hers. I wish he could see her face. She clings to a small cloud of tissue. 
They look Eastern European. I can tell this because they're well dressed, but their clothes are years out of style. I'd like to think this is their first time in Paris. I can imagine him later on straining to lift her from the chair in their gray hotel room with its withering curtains swollen by wind. I can picture her in his arms. He'll set her in the bed as though it were a slow river. A filthy homeless man is squatting with the American tourists and telling jokes in broken English. He's not looking at the girl's shaved legs, but at the unfinished bottle of wine and sullen wedge of cheese. The Americans seem good-natured and pretend to laugh. I suppose the key to a good life is to gently overlook the truth and hope that at any moment we can all be reborn. The Pont des Arts is wooden, and if you look through the slats, you can see boats passing beneath. Sometimes, small bolts of lightning shoot from the boats as tourists take pictures of one another. And sometimes, they just aim the cameras at nothing in particular and shoot. I like these kinds of photographs best, not that I have a camera, but if I did, I would randomly take pictures of nothing in particular. How else could you record life as it happens? The shell works in a shop on the Place Pigalle. Outside the shop is a flashing arrow with the word sexy in red neon. The shell has had the shop since I can remember. I'm forbidden to visit him there. Though sometimes when I watch him at his desk from the street corner, I see him reading a poet called Giorgio Caproni, who is dead. But Michelle says that his words are like little birds that follow him around and sing in his ear. If you saw Michelle, you might cross the street because he has a deep scar that runs from his mouth all the way across his cheek. He told me he got it wrestling crocodiles in Mississippi, but I'm 15 now and just humor him. He has a friend called Leon who sometimes stays the night with us because if he drinks too much, his wife won't let him into the apartment. One night, while Michelle was in the bathroom, Leon told me how Michelle's face came to be scarred. Before you lived with Michelle, he said breathlessly, there was a terrible fight outside his shop. Naturally, Michelle rushed outside and tried to break it up. He paused and slid a small bottle of brandy from his shirt pocket. We each took a sip. Then he pulled my ear through the brandy fumes to his mouth. He was trying to save a young prostitute from being beaten, but uh, the police arrived too late and then the idiots arrested Michelle. She choked, but then we heard Michelle's footsteps in the hallway and the words disappeared forever, lost in that wilderness of a drunk. Michelle would throttle Leon if he knew he told me this much because he tries to pretend that I don't know anything and that when I get into the Sorbonne, which is the <coughs> oldest university in Paris, I'll leave this life behind and visit him only at Christmas with gifts purchased at the finest stores on Avenue Montaigne and Champs-Elysees. You don't even have to wrap them, Michelle once marveled about the presents. The girls do it right there in the shop. <laughs> I like to stroll around Notre Dame, which is on its own private island. I like to see tourists marvel at the curling beauty of the stone frame. It reminds me of a wedding cake that's too beautiful to eat, though perpetually hungry pigeons know the truth. Hundreds of them drip from the dirty white ledges, pecking at the marble with their brittle beaks. Sometimes tourists go in and pray for things. When I was very young, Michel used to kneel at my bedside when he thought I was asleep. I would hear him praying to God on my behalf. He referred to me as Peanut, but I'm not sure if God knew who he was talking about. But if there is a God, then he probably knows everything and that my na real name isn't Peanut. After smoking on the steps of Notre Dame and making eyes at an Italian girl posing for her boyfriend, I'm now in the Jardin des Plantes. Michelle and I have been coming here on Sunday <coughs> since I can remember. Once I fell asleep on the grass and Michelle filled my pockets with flowers. Today I'm 15 and I'm taking stock of my life. Even though I want to go to university and eventually buy Michelle a red convertible, when I think of those Sundays in the Jardin des Plantes, I want to do things for people they will never forget. Maybe that's the best I'll ever do in life.